Well, I'm very grateful to be here this morning bringing the Word of God to you. And the bulletin says that Hannibal Rodriguez is preaching, but uh, my name is Sergio Villanueva, and uh, uh, I, I don't have the, the spectacular Colombian accent that Hannibal has. Uh, mine is a little more, more a broken Mexican accent. Uh, hopefully we'll go through this together. Uh, I've been serving, actually, um, February 1st. I celebrated my 19 years here serving in Wheaton Bible Church. And it, it was been a blessing. Yeah. Uh, I thought that I should wait to say this on next year when I turn 20. But I said, well, 19 is also another year to celebrate. Why should I wait to turn 20? Uh, it's my blessing to, to, to bring the God's Word uh, this morning. And uh, as we go through this series that I was mentioning before, the greatest story, the last three sermons that we have gone through, it has been in this chapter. We divided the whole series in four chapters. Chapter one, it was creation. Chapter two is the fall. And then we'll come to chapter three, the redemption and restoration later on. But today we start this chapter two of our sermon series, the fall, the story of pain. This is when sin enters the world. And the way that we're going to see this passage this morning is in three points, in three parts. Number one, we want to see, uh, we want to be defining, defining sin. Then number two, understanding sin. And number three, combating sin. So let's go to number one, defining. I want you to pay attention to verse three. We have it on the screens, you have it in your Bibles. Chapter 3, verse 3, God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And here we find the very, the very basic definition of what sin is. Sin, basically, it's disobedience to God. Plain and simple. Disobedience before God. So in this verse, we see that God gives specific instructions. God marks specific limits. And God explains specific consequences. So he says, you can eat of all these trees, but of this particular tree, you will not eat. Specific instructions, specific limits. And then specific consequences. If you eat, then you will die. So basically what we can do is you take anything that God has said. When God has said, you shall not blank. And whatever you put in the blank, it's sin. We can take the commandments. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not murder. Commit adultery. Covet. And all of those will have the same consequences. Lest you die. Specific instructions, specific limits, specific consequences. Now, if this is not hard to understand, I don't think that's hard to understand. Then the question is, why is it so hard to observe? Why is it so hard to observe? Anything that God has said no to, it's disobedience. Anything that God says don't do this, then it's a commandment. And disobeying the commandment is, is, is sin. See, if God says don't do this, when God says no, that becomes a commandment immediately. Specific instructions, specific limits, and specific consequences. Because every time that we say no to what God says no... We're saying yes to what God says yes. Again, this is not hard to understand. So when I was reading and when I was preparing for this, it was, if this is not so hard to understand, why is it so hard to observe? And this will take us to right away point number two, understanding sin. See, something happens in the heart of men. God created the world in perfection. God created Adam and Eve, in his own image, there was beauty, there was harmony between God and man, until men sinned. 
So chapter 3 of Genesis changes the story. There is a disruption in the perfect order that God created. There was chaos. There was chaos in the order. And of course, God is, has to do something about it. If you are the kind of person that you love to have your living room nice and tidy and organized, or your desks, some people love to have their desk pristine. And you know that if someone moves something out of that place and puts it in another place, that, that creates something. I've been at uh, Jonathan's office, uh, Jonathan Cerez, our pastor of worship, and he has several frames there. And if I go and move the frame a little bit, just like this, suddenly his eyes are no longer on me. He's like looking at me and looking at the frame, waiting for the opportunity just to bring it back to the place. Because you have order in your things. My, my wife, when she is cleaning the house, um, she likes, I don't know why some people like to, I mean, when I, when I sweep, I sweep and then I take the, all the dust and everything, put it in the garbage. She likes to do like little mountains. Like she brings everything. I don't know how many of you do that. Little mountains. And then at the end, she brings to the little mountain and dust and picks up that. So sometimes I'm just walking and I don't see the little mountain of dust. <laughs> and I just go over it and suddenly there's a scream like, no! And, I'm, and I get scared. I don't know what happened. I'm stepping onto the little mountain of dust. That is called disruption in the order of the house. <laughs> if you're like that, you know what it feels. God just created the world and made it beautiful. And suddenly there's disruption in this beautiful harmony. Adam and Eve sinned before God. And this, God comes, this is beautiful of God. God always takes the initiative. And he comes after men. Always. And then in the passage that we've seen, God is on a, going, going to ask a series of questions to Adam and Eve. And you have to ask yourself this. Why is it that God asks questions? Doesn't he know everything? So the reason why God asks questions is not to know things. It's for us to get to know things. His questions are more for us than for him because he already knows the answer. So I want to point to four questions that God is asking to Adam and Eve after this um, disruption in creation because I believe that each one of these questions is pointing towards something in our hearts. It's teaching us something. It's telling us something. Let's look, let, let's look at the first one. Genesis um, 3, verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man after they ate the, the fruit and said to him, Where are you? Where are you? Now this, in my understanding, this refer, refers to the displacement of my allegiance. Sin is a displacement of my allegiance. Again, why is God asking, where are you, if he knows where Adam is? Adam is. God sees everything. And you can say that God is taking the initiative, seeking Adam. You can say that God is also alluding to the shame and fear that Adam is showing because he, he's hiding, the passage says, because he's feeling shame. First time the mankind experiences shame and guilt and fear. And God is asking that question. But you can also say it, that God is pointing to the reality that Adam, Adam's allegiance to God is no longer where it was before. It has been changed. It has been displaced. It has been displaced by Adam's disobedience. Sin is always a displacement. Something happens in your heart when you Sin. You're no longer there where you're supposed to be. In the, in the case of relationships, 
when there is sin in a relationship, when there is unfidelity in a relationship, the person, it's there, but it's not there. Because the, the allegiance, the loyalty, the bounded to people together, it could be marriage, it could be, it could be a work environment situations, you are working for a place, but then suddenly you have done something wrong and, or something dishonest, and you are there working, but you are not there. Something moved in your heart. Your heart is no longer there. So it, if we see this this way as a displacement, if we see sin as a displacement of our allegiance, then we can understand that Adam and Eve left Eden before Adam and Eve left Eden. Before God drove them out, they already left that in their hearts. Question number two, verse 11, first part of verse 11. God, he said, who told you that you were naked? This is indicating that distortion of my identity. See, Adam and Eve were naked before they sinned, right? They were naked before. How come they didn't feel embarrassed or shame? It's because when they opened and they went against God, again, this disruption in their hearts, in their allegiance, allowed them to see themselves in a different way than they saw themselves before. This is creating a different perspective that they have on God and that they have on themselves. Because before sinning, they, they were seeing themselves through the eyes of purity. They were pure. The look that they have before the, the fall, it was pure. There was purity in the garden. Sin tainted that. Sin created an illusion. Hence, the distortion of our identity. They're not seeing themselves as they were created originally. They're not seeing God as the one who's absolute. Now they say that they know better. And that creates all sorts of complications. See, this is why when either someone has done something to you and you retaliate, and there's bitterness in your heart, or jealousy, or envy. Many times you end up seeing things that they're not there. They're not real. Suddenly, everything that everyone is doing, it's against you. And you know what I have learned? Many times that's not the case. That is just how you're perceiving it. Because the sinful heart now is creating this illusion. It is distorting the image of your neighbor. It is distorting the image of you. It is distorting the image of God in your life and in my life. Uh, this weekend... Uh, if you follow technology, you know that uh, Apple just released the Vision Pro, which is a new device that you will, it's pictures of, of go goggles that you put in front of you, and it's a super powerful computer right there. Um, so it's no longer enough to see our devices here. Now we're going to have them here. Uh, now, I need to say, I love technology. I love technology. Me and my sons, I have two sons, and we have, when, when Steve Jobs used to, develop, used to uh, unveil a new Mac years ago, my sons and I, we were there with popcorn and everything. It became like an event for us. Um, with the years, uh, technology is, is, it's all over the place. But this is becoming something that no one has seen before. And the thing that interested me the most is I'm watching several videos about the creators and the influencers, they have access to this, and they're, they're making videos telling you what is it like to be in this. Because the whole point is this. You put these goggles on, 
If I put them right now, I will see you, all of you. Like a, but then I see a floating, floating screens, like a computer. But they're in front of you. And, and now I can do whatever I have to go, do on the internet. I don't need a keyboard. I just use my hands. Because this thing has sensors all over. So if I go like this, or if I go like this, it's taking me to different places. So, so in the future, uh, we're no longer going to see people just like this. We're just going to see people walking like this. <laughs> uh, I guess that's where we're going as a, as a human society. Uh, but my point is, not that I'm wrong, I'm excited about trying one of those one day. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be soon because they're super expensive. But uh, this is what, this is what it, it got me thinking about this. Uh, the influencer, uh, the one who's making the video, is saying this. It feels so real. Because if it seems like you're looking through a glass and these um, screens are floating. But he says this, but that's not what is happening. Because this thing doesn't have glass. It's, it's covered. It's tiny monitors. So what is happening is there's a lot of cameras all around that are capturing what's out there. And you see it almost as if it's just a Glasses, but it's not glasses. He, saw the, he says this, it's a projection. In a sense, it's not real. It's a projection of the reality. And that's why in that projection of that reality, all these gadgets and apps can float around. And when I heard that, it was like, wow, that's precisely what sin does. It, it allows... It, it, it's tricking us into thinking that we're still seeing reality. But we're not seeing reality. We're seeing a projection of it. And that's why it becomes a distortion. You don't see yourself. That's why people that, are, uh, people that struggle so much, and so many of our younger generation that struggle so much about their appearance, is be precisely because of this. The sin in the heart of man of not trusting that God gave me and made me the way that he wanted to make me. But there is something, there is fear, there is shame, there is guilt. That now when I look at the mirror, I, God see beautiful creation. I don't see that. I just see ugliness. I just see fear. I just see anxiety. It's a distortion of what God intended us to be. That's what sin does. And look, it, it, it keeps going. It keeps going. Second part of uh, verse 11. Another question. God now, God now is asking this. Have you eaten of, the, eat, eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? So you did precisely what I asked you not to do when I gave you all these fruits? Did you eat the one that I told you not to eat? We're not the other ones enough for you. So this speaks of the discontent of my soul. You know that every sin, when you go deeper into sin, every sin is discontentment. Every sin is discontentment. We don't like this way. God says no to this. Somehow, I don't like that. I don't like that he said no to this. Now I want to say yes. Why does it have to say why does it have to be no? Why God knows better? What if I want to try it? What if everything that God said, see, God said no to this, but God said yes to all this. Remember, every other tree in the garden, they were able to eat and enjoy. But not this one. So, this is, this is this bears the question. Let's ponder this for a moment. Everything that God gave Adam and Eve in the garden, everything they could eat, and now the one single tree, he hauled them, it was out of reach. Was that too much to ask? The, 
The passage says that the woman saw the fruit, and she saw that the fruit was good for food, was a delight to the eyes, and was desire to make one wise. And if you remember a couple of sermons ago, Hannibal made the emphasis that what God made, he, it was good. And in fact, it was very good. But for men, for Adam and Eve, there was one problem. Even though what God made, it was very good, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Because the discontentment of their hearts. See, once there's discontentment in the heart, there's nothing you can do. Because God gave them everything and it still wasn't enough. You, if you see it that way, sin, at the root of sin, is this discontentment with the goodness of God. Because if God is good, if He is, and He made all these things good for me to enjoy, suddenly it's still not enough. I need to have this other thing that He told me not to. I need to do this other thing that He asked me not to do. It's the discontentment of our souls. Sin is discontentment with the goodness of God. And he has the power to make something that he was very good into not good enough. See, sin is dangerous. Sin, that's why sin is evil. Sin is not just a fault. It is a fault. It is a bit disobedience. But but the ramifications, they go so much deeper into our hearts. Let's go to the last question. Verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? What is this that you have done? Finally and ultimately at the core of the sin is the distrust of my devotion to God. In the end... Sin, it's about worship. It's about worship. Sin is more than just a mistake. Sin is who I decided to worship in that moment. And it was not God. Pastor John Piper wrote this. Sinning is any feeling or thought or speech or action that comes from a heart that does not treasure God over all other things. And the bottom of sin, the root of all sinning, is a heart that prefers anything above God. The discontentment, the distrust. And then Pastor Piper adds, what is sin? Sin is the glory of God, not honor. The holiness of God, not re revered. The greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of, of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored, the faithfulness of God not trusted, the promises of God not believed, the commandments of God not obeyed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished. The presence of God not prized. The person of God not loved. Sin, my brothers and sisters, is not something lightly. It disrupts the whole creation. It displaces us from our worship and allegiance to God. It brings all this discontentment in my soul towards God. He gives me this distrust of God and his goodness. The Apostle Paul will write it this way when he's writing to the Romans. In chapter 1, verse 21 to 25. For although they knew God, speaking, referring to mankind 
and sinful mankind. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, hence the distortion of identity. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, since that, that to us. And exchange the glory of the immortal God, exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature that rather than the Creator who is blessed forevermore. Amen. Ultimately, sin has to do with who are we worshiping in that moment. Theologian Leslie Newbegin said, Sin is unbelief. It turns man from God to a false God, himself. So every moment that we sin, there's actually... A moment of worship happening right there. It's interesting that uh, the first murder in human history, we read a portion of it, Genesis 4, a brother killing his brother. It happened in the context of why they, how they thought God should be worshipped. The first murder the first moment of antagonism between two brothers came in the midst of how are we going to worship God? Came in the midst of a service worship. See, sin goes wait. See, we think that sin is waiting for us outside the doors of the church, but sin comes right in and it follows us because it's not something outside of us is the discontentment in our hearts. And we carry it. And every moment when we sin, in that moment, there's a worship service happening. When Sergio sins, if I, in that moment, I desire or I end up saying what I'm not supposed to say, looking what I'm not supposed to look, thinking of what I'm not supposed to think, in that moment, what is happening in Sergio's heart is a little tiny worship service where Sergio is worshiping and the object of worship is Sergio. And I say, Sergio, you deserve everything. You deserve the glory. You deserve everything right now. You are ultimately, you rule. That's what happens every time we sin. I'm telling myself, I know better than God. That's what Eve did. That's what Adam did when he followed and ate. God said no to this, but who's God to say no? Maybe I know better. So in this moment, I decide to do what God said not to do. And that's why, my brothers and sisters, sin is not lightly. If you are in sin, repent. Return your allegiance back to God. Restore your identity in Him. Bring joy to your soul. Allow God to bring back joy into the soul. The joy of salvation, David will write in Psalm 51. Surrender your devotion fully to God and God alone. How do we do that? Let's go to... Our point number three, combating sin. How do we do this? How do we do this? Look what it says, chapter 4, verse 7. If you do well, this is God now speaking to Cain after Cain killed his brother. Remember, after he kills his brother in this act of worship, God comes to Cain and says, asking for his brother another question. And then God is telling Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you. But you must rule over it. So God is saying there's also a place in your heart, a conscience, 
an understanding of the fear of God that you have. And seeing this discontentment is coming over. But you can rule over it. And God is not saying the sin is like, like a something. Yes, God is comparing sin like a beast. But he's telling Cain, you can rule that beast. So sin is not a something. It's a distrust. It's a discontent in my heart that God wants to realign. But, but how? That's the question. How? How do we do this? How God is going to do this? Remember the part of if God says no to blank, don't do this, you shall not blank, lest you die. Lest you die. Look at what verse 21 of chapter 3 says. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothe them. God. God made. He didn't tell him, now you go find something to put on top of your nakedness. God made garments. Garments of skin. Where is it that he got this skin? Someone had to die. There were some animals that died. Because God says, don't do this, lest you die. Someone has to die. In the end, death is the only way to correct this. Either death is the consequence of sin, or death becomes an instrument of mercy and redemption in the hands of God to bring us back to Him. So this is the first moment that we see God extending mercy and grace to mankind when he himself made garments of skins. And then he says, and he clothed them. And those two words are so beautiful. God clothed them. Because this is the heart of our God. It's a God that even though he's His word has not been honored. And sin has been uh, a rising up of myself going against God. He, in the end, extends mercy. Finds a way to show mercy. Someone dies. And God made a garment and he clothed them. I want to invite you as we prepare our hearts to come to the table of the Lord. To hold in your heart this reality. The sin is something that is not wait, it's not something that just happens to me. It's my own discontentment. It's my own distrust in God that, that displays me from his presence. Then distorts how I see him, others, and myself. And the only way to escape this it's either die as a consequence of, or that someone will die for me. I would invite you as we're going to hear this worship song. Hold this reality in your heart. Let's pray. God, we humbly come to you realizing that our disobedience, our lies, our covetousness, our jealousy, our enviousness, our anger, our impatience, it's not lightly. It brings disruption to this beautiful creation. We come before you, Lord, and we ask for your mercy. 
for your grace, your forgiveness. We deserve death. Thank you for providing a way for us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. We want to respond to God's word with a special hymn that we hope touches your heart. Uh, perhaps for you today, perhaps for someone you know. And we pray that it will be a blessing for all of us. So let's stand and sing. <laughs>